Okay, hi everyone. We're going on to lecture two and part A. And uh, I know that uh, this is a mixed audience of, of students. Some are, most are dentists, but uh, I have others that are in this program from uh, pain medicine. And uh, we're going to focus on dental pains right now. Uh, so enjoy this. And if you uh, don't uh, understand some of the dental terminology. Uh, YouTube is always a good uh, Wikipedia, uh, and you can always uh, talk to me at uh, the video conferences we hold periodically. All right, so, and, and let me also say that what I'm going to cover here applies to all neuropathic pains. Now, you don't normally do root canals uh, on patients, which is pretty strong pain, uh, but it, it provides insight as to what happens to the nerve in a neuropathic pain condition. Uh, the, the, and I think the dental model is excellent for understanding this. So why can't I get the tooth numb? And uh, so neuropathic pain in the orofacial region, I, I've published a number of uh, sort of review articles in the California Dental Association Journal. The two on the right are uh, neuropathic pain uh, issues and one about pharmacology of neuropathic pain. And then I have a textbook on guides to medications and management uh, uh, with my colleague Ray Dion uh, that we published a few years ago. So uh, that's some good material. Uh, what are we going to do here? We're going to talk about anesthesia problems, buffered lidocaine, nerve receptor changes, and phenotypic changes. Uh, so hopefully you'll enjoy this part of the lecture. Now, go into a dentist, they numb you up. It's not numb. Stop drilling. <laughs> uh, why isn't it numb? That's the question. Uh, well, there's anatomic, psychological, and pathologic uh, causes, explanations. Let's go through them, and, and obviously I favor the pathologic one. There's a most common explanation. Well, uh, one, you could have given the injection in the wrong place. <laughs> That's certainly possible. Two, there could be the nerve is in the wrong place. There is a slight degree of variation in the position of the nerves, but not much, not enough to really explain all the cases we see. Um, so that's one explanation. Another is, oh my gosh, we numb that nerve, but it's still not numb. Must be another nerve that comes into the area. Accessory nerves, long buckle coming up uh, this way, uh, mylohyoid up from underneath the uh, jaw uh, muscle, uh, reticular temporal, uh, and upper cervical muscle and nerves that supply the under part of the, the chin area. Uh, maybe they innervate the teeth. Uh, I doubt it, but uh, you know what, what dentists do is they tend to do injections everywhere after that point, uh, trying to numb it up. Um, and then uh, maybe the bone is really thick and the anesthetic, which we inject outside the bone, is not diffusing through the, the thick bone. Uh, so uh, that's an issue. Not commonly present. You just wait a few minutes more and it kind of gets there. But uh, that's a possibility. Fear. You know, patients are so fearful that, that, that they, they can't they're imagining the pain because the nerve is clearly blocked. How do you how do you shut off a sodium channel blocker because of fear? Uh, well, maybe maybe you amplify what little signal there is, uh, but that's a possibility. And then there's the explanation. Well, this tooth is infected, and that means that the pH is different in the area, and therefore uh, the anesthetic isn't penetrating because it's a uh, uh, not going into the low pH areas, the, the high acidity areas. Uh, my favorite, of course, is that it's the nerve is damaged. It's sometimes hyperalgesic, spontaneously active, uh, uh, and that is the explanation. And we'll talk about how a nerve gets that way. All right. Because they're so frequently that uh, dentists have trouble getting a tooth numb, Somebody said, well, let's sell them a more expensive lidocaine, <laughs> buffered lidocaine, and claim that it works better than standard lidocaine. Well, let's look at that evidence and, and look at, obviously, a, 
uh, biased, uh, self-serving uh, thing by uh, the company that sells it, one of the companies that sell it. Uh, so this is what buffered lidocaine is. It's a, uh, an anesthetic carpule that, uh, that it has a different pH, uh, more expensive to produce uh, than the standard, and it's more money. All right, so now let's look at the research on this. Uh, and this is not research funded by the companies. Um, all right, so this guy looked at pain during injections. Oh, buffered lidocaine is better. It doesn't hurt as much uh, because the other is acidic, and this is buffered, neutral. Uh, and so they did a double-blind study. They injected standard 2% lidocaine with epinephrine and buffered lidocaine with epinephrine. It was randomized, double-blind crossover, 20 injections uh, in the maxillary uh, region, uh, labial, and the painful one in the palate. Uh, uh, and they then asked people to self-report. Is this painful? Was it painful? Et cetera. Data on self-reported pain levels after each injection failed to establish any group difference for either injection site. So no, it wasn't less painful. All right, here's a video by a company that makes buffered lidocaine. I thought you might like to hear what they're claiming. Uh, so um, uh, take it for what it's worth. All right, you're back. Uh, let's talk about whether or not um, post operative complications. After the procedure, the buffered lidocaine caused less harm to the tissue because it was buffered and the other was more acidic. Um, so let's see if there's any difference there. And again, they did a randomized uh, uh, study and they um, were doing eyelid surgery. So was buffered lidocaine worth it? Was the extra expense of buying that worth it? Now, obviously, if it was the same expense, just use it. <laughs> Whatever you want, as far as I'm concerned. But if it's two times more expensive, you have to think about its efficacy. Um, so they said no significant differences in post-operative pain, swelling, or bleeding for the two groups. And a non-significant trend to cause less pain on injection, but... Um, the other one was obviously the same thing in the mouth, and they saw no difference. All right, here's another study. And they did a prospective randomized double-blind study of anesthetic efficacy of buffered versus uh, standard lidocaine for a nerve block, where your chin goes numb, your lip goes numb, mandibular nerve block. Uh, and they did that, and they did it two different appointments one week apart, and then they tested it with a pulp tester, electrical stimulation of a tooth. And they did four cycles for 60 minutes of, of testing all the teeth, or at least the first molars, second molars, premolars, laterals, and centrals on the side that was anesthetized. And uh, essentially, buffered lidocaine produced analgesia, um, range from 10 to 71%. The unbuffered lidocaine produced successful, you could zap the tooth with the electrical stimulator um, without pain, seven to seven, 10 to 72%, exact, almost exactly the same. And they said no significant difference in the anesthetic efficacy of these two formulations. It was not faster and did not produce less pain. So, do you believe the manufacturer, eh, at least for healthy teeth, and these were all healthy teeth. Um, the buffered light, and they did blepharospasm. Uh, there was no difference. Now we didn't have a study that looked at the um, buffered lidocaine agent infiltrated in an infected tooth, where there might be a pH difference from the infection, a perifocal PAR, perifocal radiolucency, um, that uh, is a sign of infection. And that study hasn't been done, but, so, but I'm still doubtful. I'm still doubtful that it, it matters. Um, that's the issue. All right, here's another question. Um, 
what are the nerve changes? I said before, remember, I said I thought it was a nerve damage. What are the changes that make it harder to anesthetize a tooth or, or any neuropathically injured tissue site? Um, well, we have to go back to sodium gated or voltage gated sodium channels. And normally there's a, a sodium channel that is called a voltage, uh, sodium channel voltage 1.3. That is the most popular, commonly uh, inserted protein along an axon that allows sodium in and out. And, and I, it, it was categorized, obviously, by how much voltage it took to trigger it. Uh, and so a voltage 1.3. And uh, that is unfortunately not the only sodium channel out there. There's voltage 1.9, voltage 1.8, voltage 1.2, voltage 1.5, 1.4. Um, and all of these are different families, different cousins of the same drug, the same sodium channel, slightly different variations. Now, it may be that there's a different protein being produced in chronically painful conditions. And now you have new sodium channels that react differently than the 1.3. Um, and so here's a three and a half minute video on sodium channels, just sort of give you some background on the science of what they are. And we'll talk more after you're back from the video. Thank you. I mentioned here that I mentioned before that uh, sodium channels are ca categorized by how much voltage it takes to open it. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. There's another way of categorizing, um, etc. Uh, another way of categorizing sodium channels, and that's uh, dripping tetrodotoxin onto a dish with a nerve in it, stimulating one end of the nerve, recording from the other end. How much tetrodotoxin, which paralyzes, blocks the sodium channels, um, does it take to knock it out? And there's tetrodotoxin-sensitive sodium channels, which are the common ones, 1.3, 1.2, 1.1, 1.7, and the uncommon ones, which are tetrodotoxin-resistant. And so you have to put more tetrodotoxin on it to knock it out. And they're resistant and harder to block. And so they continue to fire, obviously. Uh, so there's another way of categorizing uh, sodium channels. Now, they also categorize nerves this way. If the nerve has changed, there's new sodium channels on it, then the nerve, which is what they're testing, the whole nerve, is a tetrodotoxin-resistant nerve or tetrodotoxin-sensitive nerve. And what happens with inflammation is there's a upregulation new ion channels are produced, pushed down the axon, and inserted into the membrane of the nerve. And the, what happens in chronic inflammation or chronic pain conditions uh, is there's an upregulation of sodium channel to tetrodotoxin resistant sodium voltage 1.8 ion channels, which means it's harder to uh, stop this ion channel. It's continuously uh, reacting as it should, uh, even though you give it some anesthetic. And this guy back in uh, 1999, now that would be 18 years ago, uh, Dr. Uh, S.G. Waxman said, gosh, neuropathic pain following injury or inflammation is due to sodium channel gene expression changes. So the gene that controls these proteins that become sodium channels, um, it changes what it does. It produces a different sodium channel. It goes a protein, it goes down, inserts itself, and now the nerve acts differently. And that was his theory, upregulation of, of these altered sodium channels. Um, and here's a, a video on long-term DNA changes. You know, that DNA changes can be substantial. It's not that the DNA itself changes, it's that the 
that the DNA uh, molecule um, has changes on the outside, things bind to it, and that's called epigenetic changes. Um, and so that happens. And so here's a video on it. Okay, now I've told you the theory, um, but what is the proof that it actually happens in humans? Uh, all right, let's look at that. Well, uh, Dr. Renton is a neuroscientist in London, looked at pulpal tissues in painful, chronically painful teeth. You know, you can go in and, and either pull the tooth and look at the pulpal tissue in an extracted tooth, or you can actually pull out the pulp from the tooth and look at it in a dish uh, and, and obviously uh, stain it for uh, various um, sodium channels. And they have stains that will bind to uh, sodium channel voltage 1.8 versus other sodium channels. And so they did this, and they, they compared normal teeth and painful teeth, and they saw a big difference in the fibers that stained with 1.8. And they saw a, a five-fold increase in the staining uh, level in the uh, painful teeth. And I'll just show you her, her research histogram. I mean, essentially, you, you, you embed the nerve, you slice it, you stain it, and then you measure how much black there is in, in each of these areas. One area was from a normal nerve, and the other one with all the black in it, where the stain had bound to the antigen, which is the voltage 1.8, um, um, was much blacker. And, it was, and they just measure the amount of black. And so uh, it was uh, went from less than one percent black to over almost six percent of the surface area was black, and that's a big change. And that means there's more voltage 1.8 sodium channels in the painful tooth. Now that's one study. There's been another study, and here they again took out pulpal tissues from teeth. Some were painful, some were healthy, and and, and they stained them. Uh, using a slightly different method, but they saw the same thing, a six-fold increase in the relative density of sodium channels voltage 1.8. And it just says, hey, there's an epigenetic change going on, being a typic switch in how that nerve, um, how that uh, cell body of that nerve is, is acting. It's producing an odd sodium channel. And that's just their data showing the, the various um, measures that they used in the healthy and the unhealthy or the um, inflamed pulpal tissues. And again, six-fold increase. All right, here just again a little more information on sodium channels. I thought you might like this 20-second video. We'll take questions here, and we'll end this part of the lecture and continue it in part 2b.